Friends in Christ, sometimes you find a good book and you just love to tell others. This is another one of my favorites, Alexander and the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Alexander wakes up one morning and there is gum in his hair. He steps out of bed and trips on a skateboard. He drops his sweater in a wet sink. On the way to school, he has to ride in that dreaded middle hump seat. At school, his art teacher doesn't like his invisible castle. <laughs> At lunch, his mom forgot to pack a dessert. After school, the dentist tells him he has a cavity, and he goes home, and he has to eat lima beans for supper. Before bed, he washes his face and gets soap in his eyes. He goes to his room where his nightlight is burnt out, and if that wasn't enough, he accidentally bit his own tongue. And he says, what a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. And then he says, and mama says, some days are just like that. My guess is we know what those days are like. In fact, here are the top ten signs that perhaps you are going to have a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Number ten, you're the only one who thought the dinner party reservation said casual dress. Number nine, you push the Coke button and a Pepsi comes out. <laughs> Number eight, even your twin forgot your birthday. <laughs> Number seven, you honk at a biker gang and the light turns red. Number six, the exterminator crawls under your house and never comes back. <laughs> Number five, the bird singing outside of your window is a buzzard. <laughs> Number four, even Little League puts you on waivers. Number three, your income tax refund check finally comes in the mail, and when you take it to the bank, it bounced. <laughs> Illinois, right? <laughs> Number two, the 30-day warranty just expired on your new pacemaker. And number one sign, you finally get the courage to call the help hotline, and they put you on hold. You might be in for a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. In our gospel account today of Easter, that's exactly where John starts it. But before we look at that, I just want to tell you that every time you read the Bible, pay attention to the details. The details today are so vivid, they are not the kind that someone would have just made up. But what we have is a very real, personal, first-hand account from that very first Easter morning. John starts with his focus on Mary Magdalene. It's not her last name, it's the region she is from. And she has had some terrible, horrible, no good, very bad days. Two days ago, her Lord and Master was unexpectedly crucified and killed. And then because of the Sabbath, they had to rush him down off the cross and hurry his proper Jewish burial. And then imagine waiting the whole Sabbath day without doing any work to go see his tomb. But then it was night. And without flashlights and phones, she had to wait till the next morning. And so very early in the morning, she wakes up. Imagine how she didn't sleep all night. She goes to the tomb of Jesus, and as she's approaching it, she sees that the stone is rolled away. And this could only mean one thing. Someone has moved the body of Jesus, and she doesn't know where he is. So now in her mind, not only has Jesus died, 
she might never even see his body again. And so she goes and she runs and she tells Peter and John. And they get up and they themselves hurry to the tomb. And John says, who wrote it, he literally left Peter in the dust. And when John reaches the tomb, which probably looks something like this, it must be more daylight now, he peeps down, looks through that opening, and there is no body, but he sees the linen grave cloths. And then that time, Peter catches up, and he barges right into the tomb. And Peter sees there is no body. Not only are the grave clothes right there, but folded up neatly on the side away from the other clothes is the towel that would have been around Jesus' head. And at this point, John goes in the tomb and he notices the same thing. Now one, we know it wasn't grave robbers, even though they were around in Jesus' day, because they would have never taken the time to unwrap Jesus' body like that, and if they did, they would have never left such expensive linens behind. And two, we also know it wasn't teenagers playing some kind of prank, because the head towel was folded up neatly, and not just in a heap on the floor. And John then notes, he wrote this several years after, he and Peter didn't get from the Old Testament that the Messiah would rise again. And so that first Easter, they look at the evidence of what is not in the tomb and what is in the tomb, and they're confused and bewildered, and so they just go home. But Mary stands outside the tomb weeping. And the word that John uses here for weeping is not just shedding a few tears. She is wailing profoundly. In fact, this word wailing is used elsewhere in the Gospels for parents who have lost a child. Weeping, wailing loudly. It's used of a different Mary, wailing at the death of her brother Lazarus. It's even used of Peter when he denied Jesus and the rooster crowed. And it says Peter went outside and wailed profusely. These tears, don't just, they don't show Mary's faith, but they do show her love and devotion to Jesus Christ. And so for whatever reason this time, as Mary is outside this tomb wailing loudly, she stoops down and looks like John did, but she sees two angels in white. One where the feet of Jesus would have been, one where his head was, and they say, woman, why are you weeping profusely? And she says, because I don't know where they have placed my Lord. And then as she is still wailing, she turns and, and she sees a figure behind her. And, and it's a male figure. And John tells us it's Jesus, but she doesn't recognize it as Jesus. I don't know if it's because her eyes were so watery from wailing. I don't know if it's because Jesus looked a little different in his glorified body. Or I don't know if it's just because Jesus didn't want her to yet. But supposing him to be the gardener, because who else would be there that early in a garden tomb? She goes, if you have taken him somewhere, please let me know, and I will go get him. And then Jesus says this, Mary, Mary, as soon as she hears the voice of her Lord, she recognizes who he is, and she falls at her feet to the ground and grabs Jesus' feet and cries out, teacher. Jesus told us earlier in this gospel that he is the good shepherd who knows every one of his sheep by name, and his sheep know him. And when he says her name, Mary, she immediately recognizes it is her Lord. He is alive and she believes. It's the mark of a Christian, isn't it? 
to recognize the voice of the shepherd when he calls your name and to respond in faith, teacher. Now, we have to be careful not to make excuses. There are many distractions in this life that could keep us from the voice of Jesus. In fact, a Washington Post article several months ago explains some of the worst excuses employees have ever given to their employers about why they were late for work. One of them was, well, I was here, but I was asleep in my car. Another one was, well, my fake eyelashes were stuck together so I couldn't wake up. (laughs) Really? And another one was, I had morning sickness, and it was a male. (laughs) But a Christian recognizes the voice of Jesus when he calls your name, and in faith we follow And so Jesus looks down at Mary, and he says, I think gently, stop clinging to me, but go. Tell my brothers I am returning to my God and your God, to my Father and your Father. See, Mary Magdalene doesn't make excuses. She could have said, but Lord, I'm tired. I've been up all night. Or Lord, the guys will never believe me. But instead, she goes. And she tells the disciples, I have seen the Lord, not his corpse. He is alive. And she tells them everything that he told her to say. Now, there are many things that we could talk about and how this applies to our life today, but I want to just highlight two things that John wants us to leave here with this morning. Number one, it's done. It's done. The price for our sins has been paid. The resurrection proves it. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The night before our Easter on Friday on the cross, Jesus didn't say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. My sins, your sins, paid for in full by the blood of the Lamb. And to understand the significance of the debt that Jesus just paid, think about it like this. If I only sinned three times a day, And I did that every day of my life, and I lived to be 75. At three a day, that would be over 75,000 sins. And I will be the first to tell you, along with my wife and children, (laughs) that I sin way more times than just three. There is no way that any one of us could ever try to do enough good to bring that deficit with God down to zero. But we don't have to. That's the good news of Easter. The resurrection proves that the cross of Jesus was enough. He paid for every sin right there, and he left every one of them in the empty tomb Easter morning. It's done. And secondly, because Jesus has paid the full price. Did you catch his change of pronouns? It's the first time in the whole Gospel of John on Easter morning where Jesus says, Go to my brother's. Tell them, I am going to my God and your God. I am going to my Father and your Father. Because of Easter, Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. Christianity is not just a faith. It's a family. When we are baptized into the name of Jesus, we are believers in him as our Lord and Savior. God unites us intimately to Jesus Christ so that everything that is his is ours. 
Meaning his death is our death. His resurrection is our resurrection. His righteousness is our righteousness. His Father in heaven is our Father in heaven. And His Father's home in heaven is our home in heaven too. Friends, what is the answer to even the worst, terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day? The answer is Easter. I want to tell you about Bill and Gloria. They were having a whole string of terrible, horrible, no good, very bad days. It was a very long, harsh winter that year in Indiana. Bill had a very severe case of mono. His wife, Gloria, was facing some false and untrue accusations from some people in her church. And on one New Year's Eve, when she's watching TV, she remembers sitting there scared as the news was reporting about the increase of racial tensions, the increase of drug use, the increase of the sexual revolution, the increase of the God is dead movement in the education system. And she and Bill had just learned that they were expecting their first child, and she was scared about bringing her baby into this kind of world. Then one day as she... And Bill and her father-in-law were walking across the parking lot to their office. Her father-in-law noticed something impossible. One blade of green grass, kind of like up here, broke through the layers of rock and dirt and pavement and was reaching up to the sky above. And that lone blade of grass reminded her of what happened on Easter. And it inspired her to go back and write this Easter hymn. Because he lives. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know that he holds the future. Life is worth living just because he lives. And here's the meaning in verse 2. How sweet to hold a newborn baby. What pride and joy he gives. But greater still the calm assurance that child can face uncertain days even terrible horrible no good very bad ones because he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because this God still holds the future life is worth living just because he lives Friends, I don't know how you came here this morning. What kind of hurt or brokenness or loss has been in your life? Maybe you have had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad days or a whole string of them. But this morning I want you to leave with this. The same empty tomb that changed Mary Magdalene's days. The same empty tomb that changed Bill and Gloria's days is the same empty tomb that can change your days too. Because Easter brings Jesus. And Jesus means it's done. And everything that's his is ours. And that is how Easter changes every day. Amen.